Hi, Mystery Knox listeners, and welcome back to the podcast. For today's episode, Mary and I are going to be telling some creepy stories, and we also have a few submissions from some listeners. And with that being said, listeners, have a happy Halloween. So what are you doing for Halloween? What are you guys doing? Oh, uh, we are uh, just trick-or-treating. We take the girls trick-or-treating. And then, um, yeah, after that, I will hand out candy to some little shits. <laughs> and watch a scary movie while doing so. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's about it. What are you going to do? I'm going to flip off the light. In fact, all the lights. Yeah, you're not going to hand out candy? Hell no. <laughs> you know how much bags of candy are now? $15. Yeah. At the most, 25 yeah, ex- For stuff you're going to give away. Expensive. Candy. I know. I know. I know. No, if I do that, I'm buying it for myself. I'm holding myself up in my room watching scary movies. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> that sounds amazing. I mean, I yeah. probably won't. I'll probably just fall asleep. Because I got work the next day at six in the morning, so fuck that. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Go to the next house, the light on. Yeah. See, and then I have this door that has a window. So if the lights are on, they're going to know someone's home. So I have to, like, stay out of the living room area. Oh, yeah. Our, ours is the same. It has, like, a little window. Yeah. So it's like the porch light is off. Don't even bother. Keep walking. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't mean to um, say it as, as it sounds, but it basically... Go to the no, next it's house. Fine. <laughs> it's fine, yeah. Just turn your lights off. The porch light. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. That is Halloween etiquette. If the porch light is off, you should not be knocking on the door. Well, a few years ago at the old neighborhood, um, the light was off. We were out of candy. And still, there was that doorbell. Trick or treat. My dad goes sit. He's, hey, hey, what do we have here? And so they're just... Trick or treat. He's like, ah, oh, sorry, we don't have any candy. And they're like, oh, the light being yeah. off. <laughs> and then my mom comes out in the corner. No, we have one bag. I was like, oh, shut up. That's supposed to be ours. Yeah, dude, you always save a bag for yourself. Come on. Yeah. No, what, what you heck? do is you go shopping for the good stuff and then the crappy stuff that, you know, no one wants. Yeah. That's the candy exactly. you buy. So, you know, for next year, they know that's the go. house to not go to. That works out. <laughs> or or what is it like um, people put in now dental floss and pencils mm-hmm. and writing pad. And I'm just like, what? Yeah. At that point, you're still spending money on stupid stuff. Come on. That's true. That's true. Oh, I forgot to mention. So with the kids, we'll probably watch either Hocus Pocus or uh, what is that one uh, movie with Devin Sawa? Oh, Casper? Casper, yeah, they have not seen Casper yet, so Aww. I haven't decided. Yeah, I haven't decided which one we should watch. Hocus Pocus or Casper? What do you think? Uh, I think Casper. Casper, okay. Yeah. I know everyone so, will say mm-hmm. Hocus Pocus, but and then we'll put the kids to bed, and then that's when Tyler and I will watch our yeah. <laughs> creepy whatever movie we decide to watch Halloween well, movie. Oh, okay, I was just gonna ask if you had anything lined up. No, we haven't decided yet, but, you know, we'll pick something. We have another little announcement. Oh, yeah, Um, I forgot. Sorry. Go ahead, Mary. There won't be a new episode or there won't be an episode uh, next month due again to me. (laughs) (laughs) No, um, there won't be an episode next month because I have to have surgery and recovery time is like four weeks I mean it's more but I think that's when I can really like two to four weeks that's when I can really um do stuff get back to it yeah yeah so that'll take up the most of November and we should be back in December yeah so to make up for it we will most likely have two episodes for y'all in December y'all to make up for our yeah (laughs) y'all (laughs) <laughs> for you listeners to make up for our um for no episode in november yeah but yeah since this will basically be our last episode until december 
Also, have a happy Thanksgiving if you guys celebrate Thanksgiving. And eat lots of turkey for me. And me, because I don't know if I'll be able to. With that being said, let's get to the story. Okay, so this first story is called My Wife Has Been Peeking at Me From Around Corners and Behind Furniture. It's gone from weird to terrifying. And this is from Malia Girl 1314. My wife Lynn and I have been together for six years and married for 11 months. Our entire history together has been very normal and never once have I noticed any weird behaviors or red flags. I can't stress enough how out of character this whole thing is for her. Lynn is very kind, intelligent, and thoughtful. She's always been the no-nonsense type of person. Being childish or trying to scare me is not something she'd normally do. She doesn't even like watching horror movies. When we first started dating, she agreed to watch The Shining with me because she knew how much I loved horror. She was so scared that she didn't even make it through half of the movie before we had to turn it off. She isn't into anything creepy and has never been into pranks. It's just not her cup of tea. And that's fine. But that's what was so strange about this. It's just so unlike her. I should also add that she never had any mental health issues, and as far as I'm aware, it doesn't run in her family. I know some people are able to hide their mental health problems, but in the six years we've been together, I think I'd have seen some sort of sign. Two months ago, I was in the kitchen making myself some coffee before work. I was running a bit late that morning, and I knew I wouldn't be able to make it to Dunkin' Donuts for my usual morning fix. I took a sip of my coffee as I hurried down the hall towards the front door, when I happened to notice Lynn peeking at me from around the corner ahead of me. I could only see her eyes and a strand of her long, dark hair hanging against the wall. The rest of her body was concealed behind the corner. I nearly spilled my coffee when I saw her. I did burn the shit out of my lips. Jeez, Lynn, I said, wiping a few drops of coffee from my pants. You scared the shit out of me. She immediately popped out of view like a little kid that had been caught. I heard her scurry off towards the living room, and by the time I got to the front door, she was out of sight. It was really weird, and just totally out of character for her, like I said. But I also found it kind of funny that she was being more playful and a little less serious. I shouted that I loved her and called her a weirdo. As I shut the door behind me, I heard her laughing. Her behavior was a bit odd, but it certainly wasn't something to call a priest over. I forgot about it by lunch, and by the time I got home, she was her normal self. I didn't bring it up, and neither did she, and life went on. The next incident happened three days later. It was around 2 a.m., and I had woken up to get a drink. I was standing at the kitchen island, jug of OJ in hand, when I felt a strong feeling that I was being watched. For whatever reason, I looked down at the floor and saw my wife's smiling face staring back. She was peeking at me from the other side of the island, staring up at me with wide, unblinking eyes and grinning. Grinning like the Cheshire cat. I screamed, I'll admit it. Not out of the irritation, but fear. For some reason, at that moment, I was scared. At the sound of my scream, Lynn scuttled backwards out of my view. What? Oh my god. At the sound of my scream, Lynn scuttled backwards out of my view, her hands and feet smacking the tile floor as she hurried out of the kitchen on all fours. Oh my god. Okay. I didn't run after her or even yell after her. I just stood there frozen in shock, wondering what the fuck had possessed her to do that. It took me a little longer than I'd like to admit to go back upstairs, but I eventually did. When I got to our bedroom, Lynn was lying on her side asleep, or at least pretending to be. I stood there for a while, watching her breathing to be sure she was really asleep. 
I had the feeling she might jump out at me the moment I got into bed, but she didn't. I climbed into bed and she didn't even move. Her breathing was soft and deep, and I was starting to wonder if I'd dreamt the whole thing. The next morning, I waited for her to come down for coffee, and after handing her a mug and kissing her cheek, I decided to ask her about it. What was that about last night, I asked, keeping my tone light so I didn't offend or embarrass her. She frowned over her cup of coffee, shaking her head like she had no clue what I was referring to. You were peeking at me again, from over there, I said, pointing to the spot on the floor by the kitchen island. She followed my gaze, and when she looked back at me, she burst out laughing. She laughed so hard that I couldn't help but join her. You creep me the fuck out sometimes, you know that, I said. She giggled and set her cup on the counter and wrapped her arms around my neck. You creep me out all the time, so I guess we're even, she teased. We said our goodbyes and left for work. As I drove, I kept thinking about how creepy it had been seeing her grinning at me from behind the island like that. The sounds her hands had made on the floor as she crawled away. I told myself she was just trying to be silly, just trying to join me in my love of all things horror. It's not like I was afraid of her, but it still didn't sit right with me. I started seeing her peeking at me more and more. Sometimes she'd be peeking out from behind the couch or living room curtains. Once, she even managed to get inside her grandmother's old trunk that sits at the foot of our bed. I might not have even known she was there at all, had the trunk's old hinges not given her away. She'd had the lid popped up just enough so that only half of her face peeked through. She'd been grinning like an excited toddler. It was unnerving. I didn't even know what to say to her. All I could do was stare. When I finally found my voice, I asked her why on earth she was doing this. She didn't answer, but she had slowly closed the lid, shutting herself inside the trunk. I just walked away, feeling disturbed. I didn't understand why she was doing it, but it clearly made her happy. I just hoped she would tire of the game quickly. Lynn didn't peek at me for the next two weeks. I started to think she was done with her weird prank, and I was relieved. We were watching a show on Netflix one night, and I jokingly said that I hadn't seen her peeking at me lately, and that she must have given up on her spy game. She looked up at me with a small smile and said, Maybe I've just gotten better at it. I didn't say anything, but I wondered whether or not she was joking. For the next few days, I couldn't stop thinking about what she'd said. Was she still peeking at me when I wasn't looking and I just hadn't noticed? And if so, what the hell was she getting out of this? I started to feel paranoid, constantly checking whether she was watching from around the corner or behind a door. I was jumpy whenever I was home and she wasn't in full view of me. I felt stupid and a little crazy. But after a few weeks without another incident, I began to relax. I stopped checking behind furniture and walls and told myself it was just a bad memory. And a few days ago, things got so much worse. Lynn left to go to a friend's, and I lounged on the couch and played a couple games on my laptop. Around 9 p.m., I hopped in the shower, and as I was washing the soap from my hair, I felt that awful feeling that I was being watched. I slowly opened my eyes and almost had a fucking heart attack. Lynn was peeking from behind the shower curtain. Her entire head stretched into the shower, leaving just her body outside. Her long, dark hair hung against the curtain, the ends dripping with water. Her mouth hung open in a terrible grin, eyes wide and red, as if she hadn't blinked in a while. I screamed and jumped back against the wall. She didn't move, nor did her smile waver. Her makeup ran down her cheeks in two black streaks. She looked giddy and completely deranged. I was fucking terrified. We stood like that for a few moments, neither of us saying a word. Finally, after what felt like forever, she slowly pulled her head back out of the shower, and I watched her blurry figure through the curtain as she moved backwards towards the bathroom door. 
A second later, the bathroom door slammed shut, hard enough to rattle the mirror. I screamed again and jumped out of the shower to lock the door. I stayed inside the bathroom for over an hour. Maybe I overreacted to some of you, but joke or not, I wasn't going to put up with the crazy shit anymore. That's what I kept telling myself as I paced in my bathroom, stopping to listen at the door every few minutes. Suddenly I heard a muffled sound, and I pressed my ear against the bathroom door, straining to listen. I couldn't hear anything, but I envisioned Lynn standing on the other side of the door, giggling at her joke. I felt a surge of anger. I was beyond pissed at being made to feel scared in my own house, and made to hide in the bathroom for an hour. All for what? Some joke? If it was a joke, it was an awful one. What the fuck, Lynn? I snapped. This shit is getting really fucking annoying. I waited for her to apologize, or to call me a jerk. But instead I heard a faint moan. So quiet, I wondered if I heard it at all. And then complete silence. Lynn, I called out, not able to even hide the shakiness in my voice. I got no response. Just my own heavy breathing. I swear to God, just fucking stop it, I yelled, pounding my fist on the door. I waited for her to cuss me out, something I would expect from from me talking to her like that. I never screamed at her before, but there was nothing. Just the occasional drip from the shower head. I won't deny that I was scared. Too afraid to open the damn door and face my own wife. I waited another 30 minutes or so which feels like a fucking lifetime when you're scared. Finally, I decided I wasn't going to spend the night hiding in my bathroom, so I got down on my knees and peered under the door. I almost expected to see her face peeking back at me, but thankfully, I didn't. I could see straight down the hallway to the top of the stairs, but no Lynn. I didn't know if I should be happy about that or not. I looked for a few minutes, waiting to see her head pop up over the top step, but it never came. I stood up, my hand hovering over the door, and mentally prepared myself to open it. I slowly turned the lock with shaky fingers and was about to yank it open when I heard a sound that still makes me feel nauseous when I think about it. A moan, louder than before, but this time I was able to tell just where it was coming from. I turned my head to the closet door as if in slow motion and locked eyes with my wife who was peeking out at me from the slight gap. Her eyes were still wide as ever and her mouth was hanging open in the most grotesque, gaping smile I had ever seen. I didn't even scream. I was too scared for even that. Her hands were clasped to her chest, body trembling with sheer delight as if she could barely contain her excitement. A short, raspy moan bubbled up from her throat, deep and raw, sending a shiver through my entire body. Somehow I found the ability to pull the bathroom door open and ran as fast as I could, all the way down the steps, snagging my keys and phone from the table in the living room before running outside to my car. I could hear her shrill laughter behind me, but I didn't hear her getting closer. I didn't bother shutting the front door. I drove away from the house faster than I legally should have, shivering the entire time, either from fear or the cold, maybe a little of both. I hadn't grabbed a coat or even a pair of shoes. I was still in my boxers, and my hair was still damp. I drove straight to my brother Chris's house, about 40 minutes away, ignoring any and every call and text I got. I didn't check my phone until I was safely parked in my brother's driveway. Lynn had called four times and sent a flurry of texts, all wondering where I'd gone and why I left, quote, like that. I threw my phone at the dash in a rage, furious at her nonchalant attitude. My brother and his wife were surprised to see me, especially dressed in just a pair of boxers, but told me to stay as long as I needed. Chris lent me some clothes and asked me what had happened. I told him Lynn and I had a fight, but didn't get into the details. I didn't want him to think I was overreacting, leaving my wife over a prank, even if it was a strange one. I mean, 
hadn't I encouraged her for years to lighten up instead of being so serious all the time? I had wanted her to relax and loosen up, but this was definitely not what I'd had in mind. I tried to sleep on their sofa, but my brain wouldn't let me sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw Lynn's face staring at me from inside the closet. Knowing she'd been in there with me the entire time made my skin crawl. She'd never left the fucking bathroom at all. Instead, she slipped inside the closet and slammed the bathroom door shut to fool me. The mere thought of going back home gave me anxiety. I tossed and turned, unable to sleep. Chris ended up giving me a sleeping pill, so I was able to get a little rest. My sleep was filled with terrible dreams, all of Lynn's smiling face. I woke up just as the sun started to rise. My sore body ached from the sofa, and I felt drained. I knew I'd have to call in at some point, but I didn't know what to say to her. I wouldn't be going home, unless she gave me her word that she'd never do any more creepy shit. I just wanted my wife back. Her normal, serious self never looked so good to me. I was contemplating calling her and telling her that, when that familiar feeling came over me. I was being watched. I was staring at the ceiling, my heart in my throat. I didn't want to look away, but the longer I ignored the feeling, the worse it got. My eyes drifted away from the ceiling almost on their own. Her face was pressed up against the window beside the couch staring down at me with that same gaping smile. Drool dribbled down her lips, leaving two long streaks down the glass. I didn't know how long she'd been there, but something told me she'd been there quite a while, possibly all night. I didn't bother screaming, though I was afraid anger trumped any fear I felt at that moment. I jumped up from the couch and pounded my palm against the glass. Lynn, are you crazy? What the hell is wrong with you? Just go home, I shouted. Now. She didn't move, and her ghastly expression never changed. If anything, her smile only grew, as if she had never been more elated. I could hear Chris and his wife moving around upstairs. As if Lynn could hear them from her place outside, her head twitched slightly in their direction, and she began to close her mouth slowly. Chris called my name from upstairs, obviously concerned. I turned to see him and his wife, Rebecca, hurrying down the steps. When I turned back to the window, Lynn was gone. The only sign she'd been there at all was the two streaks of drool still dripping down the glass. I tried explaining to Chris and Rebecca about waking up to see Lynn watching me through their window. They were skeptical. Who wouldn't be? Chris and I went outside to the spot in front of the window, but there were no footprints in the dirt. Just a slight indent. Animal, probably, Chris guessed. And I didn't argue. He and Rebecca assumed I dreamt the entire episode, but they didn't understand, and I was too tired to explain it to them. I called out of work that day and turned my cell off. I didn't want to face Lynn. Just talking to her was too much for me at that point. I really started to believe something was irreversibly wrong with her, that no matter what promise she made, we'd never be the same again. The thought saddened me to my core. I cried most of the morning. By noon, I figured I was ready to confront her, give her one last chance to explain herself. I could at least give her that after six years, I told myself. I turned my phone on and saw the dozens of texts she'd sent, all from a seemingly concerned wife. Can we talk? I love you. Please call me. I'm really worried. Can you answer? Just come home. And more of the same. All the texts telling me she loved me and she wanted me home. How worried she was. Not a damn one addressing the crazy shit she pulled. Like she hadn't been acting like a character from a Stephen King book. Even her texts were different. She normally texted novels just to tell me to pick up a loaf of bread. You'd think she'd have more to say to me after her bizarre shenanigans. I know it probably seems childish to some of you who are miles away from this situation, but if you saw the way Lynn looked at me, how she scampered away on all fours, like some wild animal, 
grinning at me from inside the closet like a lunatic, and then I think he'd find my reaction was warranted. I ended up staying with Chris and Rebecca for another night. I didn't wake up yesterday until afternoon, and thankfully I didn't see Lynn's face watching me through the window. I don't want to pry because it's not my place, but is this fight something that can be mended, Rebecca asked. She'd made both of us a sandwich for lunch, and I knew she wanted to breach the subject without seeming to be nosy. I don't know. I just... She's like a different person, I said, choosing my words carefully. I still wasn't ready for her or Chris to know the full extent of the batshit craziness I had been dealing with. People change, Ben, but she's still the same woman you married. Maybe you just both need to talk through your issues. Whatever's going on, I'm sure it can be fixed, she said, ever the peacemaker. I think it's beyond that now. I don't think talking would help. I just don't trust her, I said. The words stung in my heart. I missed and loved my wife. But how could I live with someone like that? Living in constant fear didn't sound too appealing. Lynn loves you. She has to be absolutely crushed, she said. I don't know about that, I said. Well, she certainly seemed like it to me. I've never seen her so upset. Very much unlike the Lynn I know, Rebecca said, shaking her head sadly. It took a full minute for her words to really sink in, and when they did, I felt dread worming its way through my skin. Wait, what do you mean? You saw her? You saw Lynn? I asked, my mouth suddenly dry. Rebecca nodded casually as if that fact wasn't nightmare fuel. Maybe for her, it wasn't. She stopped by this morning just after Chris left for work, she said, cleaning the plates from the table. I didn't see her car, though. Maybe she took an Uber or something. What did she say? Did did she come inside, I asked, sweat starting to break out on my forehead. I began looking around, examining corners, as though a predator lurked behind them. No, she just asked if you were awake yet, and I said that you weren't. I asked if she wanted me to wake you, but she said no. Just said to let you sleep, she said as she washed the dishes. That's all? She didn't say anything else, I asked. No. She looked awful, though, like she hadn't slept in days. I think you should call her. I got up from the table and thanked Rebecca for lunch. I felt a little bit better at the knowledge that at least she hadn't come inside. Still, I needed to double-check that the doors were locked. I sat for a while trying to figure out what to do next. I didn't want to go home, but I felt that I owed it to Lynn to help her if I could. Hadn't I sworn an oath to love and honor her through sickness and health? Clearly, she was very sick. If she was sick, which I truly believed she was... I had to try and get her the help she needed, but I didn't even know where to start. I didn't want to call the police, and besides, what the hell was I going to tell them? That my wife was peeking at me? That she was being creepy? As bizarre as she'd been, she still hadn't committed any crime, not yet anyway. The police would have probably said that I was overreacting. But this wasn't some prank. It felt wrong. Dangerous, even like something sinister lurked beneath her smile. I knew as her husband I was well within my rights to have her committed, but what if she simply acted normal in their presence? She'd obviously been able to fool Rebecca into thinking she was just a concerned wife. As long as the doctors didn't find her a danger to herself or others, they'd have no choice but to release her after 72 hours. I felt lost and overwhelmed. So I did what any husband in my position would do, I called her mother. I didn't want to, believe me. <laughs> her mother, Marianne, and I were never on the best of terms. We'd never fought or anything like that. She just wasn't a very warm person and wasn't really easy to get along with. She hardly ever smiled, and when she did, only her lips would move into a thin-lipped smile, leaving her eyes as blank as before. She gave off this aura that felt like she was permanently on the offensive. I'd only met her twice, and both times were for such short visits. I got the impression she didn't approve of me for her daughter. Lynn always ushered us out quickly, as she didn't want me to feel uncomfortable, which I was grateful for. 
Being in her mother's company felt almost unbearable, like walking on glass. I was glad when we moved three states away so we didn't have to see her often. I was happy to avoid the woman, but I needed her help. I really didn't want to talk to her at all, but I had to talk to someone and someone who knew Lynn better than I did. So I gripped my teeth and did what I had to. Yes, she answered, already sounding irritated. Marianne, it's me, Ben. Do you have a minute to talk? I asked. I could hear her cluck her tongue in irritation. I'm in the middle of writing some checks, but if you insist, I suppose I can spare a moment. What is it that you want to discuss, Benjamin? She said coolly. It's about Lynn. She's been acting strangely, and I was wondering if you had any idea whether there was something... I was quickly interrupted. It's a bit difficult to follow your rambling, Benjamin. What is that you want from me? She asked. I could almost see her standing there in her thin sweater and slacks, tapping her fingernails impatiently on the table. I wanted to know if you'd ever noticed any odd behavior, or possibly any mental health issues, I asked. There was a long, uncomfortable pause that I couldn't tell was because she was just thinking, or something else. Finally, after a few seconds, she spoke. I'm not sure if this is one of your jokes, Benjamin, but if so, I don't find the humor in it. Now, I do have business to attend to, as I've said, so if you don't mind, she said, but I cut her off before she could get rid of me. Marianne, it's not a joke. I'm sincerely concerned about Lynn's mental health. Her behavior has been very erratic lately. I'm very worried about her, and I figured, as her mother, you would be as well, I said, my frustration evident in my voice. If you're truly concerned, then I suggest you get the health professionals involved. I don't know what you expect of me, she snapped. I could tell she was seconds away from hanging up, and for some reason, I was desperate not to let her. I had the feeling that she knew a lot more than she was letting on. Please, if not for me, do it for Lynn, I tried. I heard a faint, shaky intake of breath, as if she were trying to hold her steely persona together, but failing. Marianne? What's ru- I started. Benjamin, I don't know what to tell you. My only advice would be to seek professional help. Do not call here again. Goodbye. I tried to call out to her, but she hung up. I tried to wrap my head around the call and her refusal to help me. Even if she didn't like me, why wouldn't she want to help her own daughter? I couldn't understand that. I tried to replay the conversation, desperate to find something I missed. After a while, I almost gave up, until I remembered her last words to me. Seek professional help. She'd said those words with a bit of urgency. I could have just been grasping at straws, but no. I was sure her voice had changed ever so slightly when she'd said that, as if they were very important. What had she meant? I assumed she'd been referring to medical professionals. But maybe she was referring to someone else. Someone that she didn't, for some reason, feel comfortable saying directly. Or maybe I was just desperate. I waited for Chris to get home, and after a very long and exhausting conversation with him and Rebecca, I convinced them that Lynn truly needed psychiatric help. I didn't tell them everything. I wasn't prepared to go into it yet. But I told them about our last encounter, how she'd hidden in the bathroom, peeking at me from the closet. They were obviously shocked, but thankfully, they believed me. They too just wanted to help her. Still, they didn't think it was all that serious. Weird, maybe, but not dangerous. They just kept saying that Lynn had to be playing some kind of weird joke. Maybe for you two, Rebecca offered, if only half-heartedly. Chris didn't think we should involve the police just yet. He offered instead to go with me, and I readily accepted. He reasoned that calmly talking to her, trying to coax her into going willingly, was the best recourse. I agreed to do it his way. At least I wouldn't be going into that house alone. We drove over this morning, just after breakfast. There was no way I was going at night. When we pulled into the driveway, my stomach began doing somersaults. Her car wasn't there, but I still didn't let my guard down. The front door was ajar, and for a split second, I thought we'd see her eyes staring through the gap. I was shaking and starting to sweat. Chris, however, was fine. 
He waited for me to open the door, his hands in his pockets like he was going on a fucking stroll through the park. I envied his ignorance. I pushed the door open and was immediately hit with the stench of rot. Chris smelled it too, and he walked in the house behind me with his nose scrunched up. What do you guys use to clean the floors around here? Shit, Chris mumbled. Shut up, I said, my eyes darting around for any signs of Lynn. The house was deadly quiet and dark, despite being ten in the morning. All the curtains were closed up tight, refusing to allow any sunlight inside. If I hadn't left it just two days prior, I'd have thought the house to be abandoned. We moved through each room, carefully checking any place that she might hide, occasionally calling her name. Why the fuck are you looking under the couch? Chris asked eventually. Aren't we looking for your wife? He was looking at me like I was a moron. Let's just go upstairs, I whispered. He shook his head, but followed me up the stairs to check the bathroom and spare bedroom. On the way up, my shoes crunched over pieces of glass that looked to be littered over a few of the steps. I noticed that one of Lynn and my wedding portraits that hung on the wall along the staircase had been smashed. The frame hung crookedly, all the glass removed. I stared at the picture, a lump forming in my throat. We had taken the photo just after leaving the church, after saying our vows. She looked so beautiful in her white gown. I looked at Lynn's beautiful face. I never dreamed her face would ever be a source of terror for me. We climbed the rest of the steps and checked the spare bedroom, but it looked completely untouched. I was hesitant to go into the bathroom, my fear from that night coming back to me all at once. Chris noticed and offered to go in by himself, but I couldn't let him do that. So we walked in together, checking the closet and the shower. The bathroom looked as if it hadn't been touched since the night I left. I don't think she's here, Ben. Why don't you pack some clothes and we'll try coming back tomorrow or something, Chris said. I nodded and went into our bedroom and shoved some clothes into a duffel bag. When I checked inside our closet, I came across the source of the smell and gagged. Chris took one look and lost all color in his face. He had to go stand by the stairs to get away from the sight and smell. I gazed down in shock at what lay inside my bedroom closet. Soaking into the rug were at least a dozen eyeballs, all carefully laid out in pairs. Some were as large as a quarter, while others were as tiny as a marble. I stared down at the eyes she'd collected from small animals and I wondered how she'd gotten them, and shuddered at the thought. Man, I thought I had it bad with Becca's shoe addiction, but fuck me. Your wife's in here collecting eyeballs, Chris said, gagging. Ben, I think we should go, he called from the hall. I'm getting nauseous. All right, I grabbed my duffel and shut the closet door on my new nightmare. I stepped out into the hall and took a deep breath of air. I could taste the rot on my tongue, and I couldn't help but gag. Who the fuck lines up eyeballs in their closet like that? Chris mumbled. I tried to tell you she needed help, I said. She doesn't need help, Ben. She needs a fucking exorcist, he said. You coming or what? I can't stand the smell any. His words died in his throat and his eyes grew wide with fear. I didn't ask him why. I could feel it. Someone was watching me and I didn't think it was the eyes in the closet. I turned around, my eyes slowly scanning the bedroom. Christ, I whispered, as I finally saw what we'd missed. Under the bed, curled on her side, watching us with the excitement of a kid on Christmas morning, was my wife. She held her hands together just under her chin, and they were shaking eagerly. Now that she knew she'd been found, I could hear the quiet noises she was making a sort of hiccuping sound in her throat, as if the excitement was just too much for her. It was unnerving, to say the least. Wide eyes, and that same huge smile. Everything in me told me to run, but I forced it away. This was my wife. No matter how twisted, she was still the woman I married. I had to help her. Lynn, I said softly. She didn't respond but her head bobbed back and forth in two quick little movements as if she were nodding. 
baby, I just want to help, okay? Can you... Can you let me do that? I asked. I had taken a single step forward, approaching her like some kind of dangerous animal. I love you, Lynn, I said softly, taking another step closer. She let a tiny moan escape her wide-open mouth, and I had to resist the urge to run. Her shoulders were starting to quiver, and her eyes grew as large as saucers. I crouched down so I could see her better, and immediately saw the blood. Her hands were covered in it. They trembled more the closer I got, as if she was barely able to contain herself. Lynn, are you hurt? You're bleeding, I said. She bobbed her head again, her bloody fingers moving up and down as if playing an invisible piano. They occasionally grazed her chin, leaving smears of blood on her skin. I wanted to recoil in disgust. The smell that was coming off her was revolting. I could feel the vomit trying to climb up my throat. Her lips were dry, stretched thin, blood seeping between the cracks. I knew she wouldn't come out on her own, but I didn't want to leave her in the state she was in. I scooted closer and reached out to her. The excited, hiccuping sounds got louder, and her hands shook, fingers flexing. It was then that I could see blood oozing from in between her fingers. Oh my god, Lynn, you're bleeding, I said. Instinctively, I reached out to take her hand, but before I could even touch her, her hand sprang out towards me. A sharp pain shot through my arm, and I fell back on my ass. My arm burned, and I could see blood dripping down on the carpet. I looked back at her in shock and saw her grinning madly, her fingers clutching a large shard of glass. You all right in there? Chris asked from behind me. I turned my head slightly and nodded to him, cradling my arm to my chest. When I turned back to face Lynn, I saw that her focus had shifted. She wasn't looking at me anymore, and she wasn't smiling anymore either. She was staring past me, her eyes glaring at Chris the way a hungry lion might stare at an antelope. Her mouth was still hanging open, but it was twisted into a snarl. I got to my feet and began walking backwards down the hall, afraid to take my eyes off her. Are you bleeding? Chris asked. The moment the words left his mouth, Lynn started fast scooting out from under the bed, the glass shard still in her fist. Chris, run, go, I yelled. He must have been too afraid to move because a second later I felt my back bump into him. He was still standing at the top of the stairs, staring at the horror that was my wife. Lynn had crawled completely out from under the bed and stood in the bedroom doorway, her face twisted in rage. Her whole body was visibly tense. Blood ran down her fingers and onto the floor. Jesus, Lynn, Chris said. You, uh playing hide-and-seek? I reached back and pushed him towards the steps. Move your ass, Chris, I said, as quietly but as firmly as I could. Lynn bobbed her head in fast, sharp motions and began to grin, stretching her mouth open wider and wider, so that her chin seemed to touch her chest. I heard Chris mutter a prayer, and then he was running down the stairs. I stood at the top of the steps, stuck between the love for a woman who clearly needed serious help and self-preservation. I only want to help, I said, choking back tears. Her eyes focused on me once again, and she slowly lifted the glass, holding it out in front of her. And then she started sprinting towards me, grinning with utter excitement. Thankfully, my body took over, and I flew down the stairs, skipping two or three at a time. I made it to the front door before I felt her leap onto my back, wrapping her arms around my neck, her open mouth next to my ear so that I could hear those terrible hiccuping sounds up close. I shook her off me, knocking her to the floor. I felt a searing pain in my back as she went, but I tore open the front door and bolted to my car. Chris was standing in the front yard, talking on the phone with the police. I didn't say a word. I just ran to my car and jumped in. Chris took the hint and followed me, still on the line with 911. I watched the rearview mirror, sure I'd see her there, running after us, but I never did. 
I went straight to the ER and I got 11 stitches in my arm and three on my back. The police asked a lot of questions and went back to the house to do a search, but of course, Lynn wasn't there. They advised me to stay with a friend or relative for a while and to file a restraining order as soon as I could, but none of those things would matter. Somehow, I just knew. I dropped Chris off at home and went to a motel an hour away. I wanted to put as much distance between me and Lynn as I could. This is where I've been for the last four hours. I thought maybe the police would find her. Maybe they'd get her the help she desperately needs. But now I don't think so. Because 40 minutes ago, I got a text from an unknown number. Just three words. I found you. And a picture attached. The picture was dark and grainy. But I instantly knew what it was. There was no mistaking my wife's eye. I started typing this out immediately after. I don't know what to do. I'm alone and scared. And I can't help but feel that I'm being watched. Alright, so this next one is called Don't Ever Sleep in Your Car on a Road Trip. Actually, you should be called Don't Sleep in Your Car Down a Sketchy Road, but, you know, whatever. Or in this case, a sketchy rest stop. I'm from Connecticut. I was in a long-distance relationship with a girl from Georgia and would often make road trips down to visit her. I don't really mind. I love road trips. I've driven across the United States and back all on my own. There's just something about traveling the highways of the U.S. by yourself that's just so freeing. To save money, I would sleep in my car. It's not so bad. It's basically camping in a metal tent. Makes you feel like you're really rough in it. Just recline in the back seat, keep the keys in the ignition just in case, and doze off. No, I don't put anything up to block the windows for privacy. But maybe I should have. The trip down south was a comfortable two-day drive. My stop would usually be somewhere along the Virginia-North Carolina border. So for my previous trip, that's exactly where I stopped that night. Rest stops were often less trafficked and thus quieter than truck stops. Normally I would have stopped at a Love's, but I was so tired that I settled for the first rest stop I saw. It was oddly vacant that night, with only a couple lone cars sitting forlorn under the amber street lamps, most likely travelers with the same idea as myself. I pulled into a parking spot away from the others under the shadow of a tree and far from the street lamps. I figured I would have more privacy there as opposed to being bathed in light. So I did my usual thing, locked my doors, opened the window just a hair for ventilation, kept my keys in, reclined the seat, and went to sleep. I was never interrupted on any of those car camping nights, so I never suspected anything on this one. Then a sharp tap woke me up. At first I thought I had heard it in my dream. I opened my eyes, a bit confused. Since I was leaned back, I was facing the ceiling and couldn't see anything. I hear another tap, like a tiny object hitting a hard surface. Was it raining? Was water dripping onto my windshield? I'm under a tree, maybe something fell from the branches. Maybe a squirrel or a bird dropped something. What if a squirrel was climbing around my car? Or what if it wasn't an animal? The thought occurred to me that it might very well be a person poking around outside. What did they want? Were the doors locked? Yes. The keys were in the ignition. I can leave in an instant. Still, I lay there completely still, pretending to be asleep. Pretending I hadn't heard anything. Hoping whatever it was, they would leave me alone. It was better not to find out. I was too afraid to find out. It was better to stay here in bliss ignorance. Still the tapping continued. I had to do something. There was no way I was just going to stay there. I had to look. My heart was pounding. In that moment it was deafeningly loud. Whoever was out there could probably hear it. I decided I was going to look. I was going to raise my head up and see what was making the noise. So that's what I did. What met my eyes sent a jolt through my entire body. Every muscle fiber locked up in pure shock at what I saw. 
the faint glow of the street lamps cast just enough light for me to make out what I was looking at. There in the windshield, staring directly at me, was a face. Someone, I presumed to be a woman, was lying on my hood, her face pressed right up against my windshield. Her face was completely still, locked in a permanent grin. I froze in overwhelming terror. The eyes I stared into appeared to have rolled back, showing only the whites. The nose was turned up, pressed painfully into the glass. The lips stretched wide, revealing horrid, rotten teeth. Even in the darkness, I could tell her skin was sickly pale, contrasting her long, filthy black hair. Whoever this was was clearly not in her right mind. I don't know how long I sat there, too afraid to move. Finally, I got a grip of myself and shot my hand to the ignition. It turned over, making in that instant the most beautiful sound I've ever heard. And for a split second, I was afraid I might be caught in a horror movie scenario, one where the car won't crank as a killer approaches. I reversed as fast as I could, trying not to give this creeper time to try anything. In my panic, I remembered activating the windshield wipers in a futile attempt to get her off. I thought, was I about to drive out of here with some wacko holding onto my hood? Thankfully, I didn't have to worry about that, because as soon as I stopped, the woman leapt off, landing on all fours. Seeing my opportunity, I shifted into drive and gunned it right as I saw her reaching for the driver's side door. With my foot on the gas, I sped out of the parking lot. Behind me, I heard her let out a piercing shriek like that of an animal. I looked in my rearview mirror and for a split second I thought I saw her chasing me, running on all fours, her black hair swinging wildly behind her. I couldn't get a good look as I rounded a curve in the road leading out of the rest stop and merged with the highway. There I picked up speed and drove through the night. I did not dare to stop again until I saw the morning light. End the end of that story, which was by one planche man, I guess. I could be saying it wrong, but the link will be in the description where you can find this Reddit story. Bye! Because that story was so short, Kim was like, you need to record another one. Just like that. She said it just like that. So you're getting another one. Alright, so this next one is entitled... I'm a park ranger at Mount Rainier. People keep going missing, and I think I found out why. 25. That is the number of people who have gone missing at the park since the beginning of the year, with nothing being done or said about it. In fact, I'm pretty sure I'll lose my job when they find this posting, but I have other things to be scared of at this point, and this needs to get out. I'm a wilderness ranger at Mount Rainier. My job is to walk the hundreds of miles of trail and wilderness in the park looking for problems and helping lost and injured hikers. In the old days, any lost hiker would mean all of us going out together, putting together a search plan and doing our best to get them home safely. Things are different today, ever since the start of 2022. When a person gets reported as missing, the family is assured that we are on it and we will do our best to find them and promise that they will dispatch us to look. As soon as the family is gone, our bosses tell us that they'll have a search and rescue company take over. And if we know what's best for our jobs, we should just focus on checking trail conditions and doing the rest of our jobs. And so it's gone on since 2022. At first, there were just a few people missing here and there all over the park. It didn't seem that unusual other than our rangers not being involved in the search, but we figured it was some new policy and shrugged it off. More people started disappearing as the year went on, making all of us wonder what was going on, and why it had been made clear to us that we should keep our mouths shut. Personally, I figured it was just a combination of bad trail conditions from a rough winter, an influx of inexperienced hikers, and the park service trying to avoid looking bad when we needed more funding until last Thursday. It was an overcast day and I was walking along the trail up to Ipsit Pass. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, I have no idea. In the Carbon River area, humming quietly to myself to pass time and wondering how far up I would go before I had to put on crampons, when I saw it. Off to the side of the trail, maybe 50 feet into the forest, there was an odd light on the forest floor. At first, I thought the light was just a reflection off of water or some trash someone had left, but as I moved closer, the light didn't fade or change, it just stayed steady. 
Maybe it was a lost flashlight. I walked this trail dozens of times. I never noticed it before. I knelt down, taking my pack off, and saw that the light seemed to be coming just from under the dirt. For some reason, I felt uneasy. I looked around to see if anyone else was nearby on the trail and saw no one. Shrugging, I reached into the dirt to poke at the light to see what it was. Poking around, I found the corner of a slightly open trap door that was mostly only a foot wide on each side. It was camouflaged nearly perfectly. If it had not been left just barely ajar with the light exposed, there's no way anyone would have seen it from the trail. I kept opening it, feeling uneasy, but hoping it was some sort of buried seismometer. Or at worst, maybe some hiker's idea of a good place to keep food and water for a long trek. Instead, I found the opening to what appeared to be a small burrow of sorts, with an electric camping torch at the corner. I shoved my head down to look inside. The space was small, with enough room for one person if they didn't mind contorting themselves. On the walls of the burrow were dozens of Polaroid photos of people hiking. All of the photos seemed to have been taken very low to the ground. The photos were from all over the park, many dozens or more miles apart. Most of the photos I didn't recognize, but among them I saw a few that I knew for a fact were hikers that had gone missing over the last year. Then my heart stopped. I saw a photo of me hiking along the Ipset Pass Trail around a half hour ago. Crack! I heard a twig snap somewhere around me. I took my head out of the burrow and started running down the trail the way I came. I didn't look back or stop until I got to the wilderness cabin near Ipsut campground. I locked and barricaded the door and waited until another ranger showed up the next morning, not sleeping a wink. I asked him to walk along the Ipsut Pass trail with me. He was annoyed that I wouldn't say why, but agreed. We spent an hour looking but couldn't find any sign of the burrow. I asked for some time off right afterwards, and my manager seemed very suspicious and demanded to know why. I made up some excuse about my family and didn't tell him or anyone else what I saw. For some reason, I knew that telling them would at best end with me losing my job. I don't know who or what made the burrow, but I think it's taking people at Rainier, and for some reason the government is covering it up. I wish that was the end of the story, but it's not. This afternoon I saw something glinting from within the air vent on the floor in my kitchen. I thought maybe my cat had stuck another toy in it. I took the grating off the vent to take the toy out. Instead of a cat toy, I found a Polaroid photo taken low to the ground of me making breakfast this morning. And that story was submitted by Beatrice Abraxas to Reddit. And for the next story coming up is our only listener submission. Kind of disappointed in you all, but it's also expected. Anyway, this next story is submitted by Jerome. And it's a very interesting take on... Well, I'm not going to say anything about the lore or what he's going to talk about, but enjoy! So in the Navajo culture... There are beings that they believe exist that are called skinwalkers. Skinwalkers are a type of witch in the Navajo culture that's very harmful. They they can um, they have the ability to turn into or possess or disguise themselves as an animal. In the Navajo language, they are called Yenaltloshi, which basically means with it he goes on all fours. They are considered to be very dangerous because that's all that they do. But the story that I'm about to tell you is a first-hand account of not me, but um, a friend of my brother's. It actually, my 
brother's brother-in-law. Uh, what had happened was when they used to work for a supermarket back in the day, both of them would go into work at about 5 o'clock in the morning. So this was in Gallup, New Mexico. But since we're Navajos, we live outside of the town. My brother would drive for about maybe 30 minutes to get into town and get to his workplace, the grocery store. And his brother-in-law lived a little further. He used to take about at least an hour to get to work in the morning. Well, on one of the mornings, his brother-in-law had gotten ready and, you know, just a typical morning. Um, he had left probably around four. And, you know, four o'clock, as we know, it was pretty dark still. And, you know, he, um, he used to carry himself a um, police scanner. So, you know, to see if there's any roadblocks or see what's going on and all and all, and all the other stuff but one day he, he said that he, he told my brother when he got to work that he uh that he was pretty shooken up because he had heard something very crazy on the police scanner that he had apparently while he was driving in his police scanner caught something from a Navajo Nation Tribal Police Cop. It all started with him pulling over a car that was driving without headlights. No lights at all, actually. As he, as my brother's brother-in-law heard it, was, you know, the cop uh, pulling over a car without any headlights, without no lights at all. He got out of his car that was the last time you know that he had uh had any kind of uh like that's the last thing that he had heard is that you know he's gonna go up and check for his license and see who he, uh, who, who he was and what was going on so he got out and i guess he walked to the car and not probably about 15 seconds, maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute. I don't know how long. But the officer came back onto the police scanner, but he he, he was pretty freaked out. You know, he he started saying different things, saying you know, the person had gotten out of his car and took off. So he was running after him. But he said that he, the suspect, I guess, we'll just call him the suspect. He ran off, he pushed him, and the officer said that he had, like, crazy strength. He pushed him, and he flew 10 to 15 feet. And he was surprised by that. And by the time he got out, it was, he got out his gun and everything else the guy fled and as he got back on the scanner he was running towards him through the bushes you know and trees and uh, he was running after him for for quite a while because on the scanner he said that uh, he was huffing and puffing and you know saying that he's he was catching up to him but he went down a ditch. The suspect had gone down the ditch, and and he had called for backup. And uh, he didn't know if he was if the suspect was armed or not. Um, it didn't seem like he was. As he as he went down the ditch, the cop went down there with him and started following him. But he lost, him. and he was trying to get out of the ditch, trying to find a way to get back out. So he went back to where he got in and tried to get back up but 
but he couldn't so he had to go further down and find a way to get back up but as as what as he was doing that he heard something you know like a like somebody who who had like body pains or something so he he shined his flashlight toward it the sound and with the bushes there and everything you know something was ruffling in the bushes so he went towards it towards the bushes and with his gun drawn his flashlight on him and you know with a loud voice he asked him he told him or told the if that's you to come out and with your hands up you know he's, he's, he doesn't he didn't want to shoot him so you know just uh give yourself up but he not knowing that you know it could be an animal it could be you know something else but <laughs> i'm pretty sure you know with as a as a navajo cop as being a navajo you know he probably heard about all the stories about skinwalkers you know boogeymen and and the like you know um but i'm pretty sure he was pretty pretty shook but you know he's got to do his job so he kept on going towards it and the, the moaning and the groaning had stopped and as, as he got closer uh right when he got to the to the bush he he got startled and he flew back because a deer had jumped out from behind the bushes and with no with with no or very little effort the deer was able to jump up out of the ditch and ran off the guy was so spooked that you know he he didn't know what was going on so he um he got up and he shone his light towards the bush but where what what he found at the bush were the guy's clothes the guy that he was chasing the clothes were right there his boots were thrown to the side and no guy you know where did the guy go you know so he he was thinking oh no you know the 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 thing that the, the deer was did the guy actually change into the deer or somehow did he take off naked you know but there's no as he was shining his his flashlight around on the ground on the dirt his footprints his his uh, shoe prints his boot prints led up to the the bush but it didn't go any further you know he was looking around to see if he could see any barefoot without shoes bare bare feet footprints but he couldn't find any all he found was the footprints of the of the deer that jumped out and scared him and he was back on the the police scanner my brother's brother-in-law said that that he was on the verge of crying and you know just panic he could not believe what he had seen what he had just witnessed he went on the scanner and said that on the radio you know the the police radio and said that uh I'm pretty sure that he had just come face to face with the skinwalker um you know there's no other explanation 
and <laughs> he the the cop was just out of it you know he didn't know what else to do he, he ran towards to where he can get out of the ditch which he eventually did I guess you know um but my brother's brother-in-law uh couldn't take it anymore you know couldn't he you know when you're driving out on the res there's no street lights there's no lights pretty much at all just the lights from the vehicle so <laughs> he told my brother that he was so scared that he had to call in and drive back to the house turn around and drive back to the house and just so he could be with his family and not not by himself because of what he heard that's that's pretty crazy you know and um with the first hand hearing it on the on, on the scanner on the radio he was he he was pretty shook up too but my brother was telling me this not that long ago not long after that happened so is it was it skinwalker I don't know. Could have been. I'm pretty sure it was, but you could say that that you can't you can't believe it until you see it, which is kind of where my stance is. I've I've never I've never really seen one or you know witnessed a transformation or anything like that. I've seen different things. You know, different animals popping out out of pretty much nowhere it seemed like so it could be possible it could be possible i mean there are stories and it could be the mind's mind playing tricks on them but it's part of the culture and if it happened to more than one person that's pretty crazy you know i myself i don't know <laughs> I don't know if it's real or not, um, but I can tell you that cop, I don't, I don't know if he's even a cop anymore, because that would scare the crap out of me. I mean, one time, this is just a quick a quick one for me, because we, as you know, happened on the, on the res to our uncle, my mom's brother, was at the house one weekend and on Sunday sun Sunday evening uh, we had to drive him home me my with my two brothers and my no my three brothers and my two cousins we had to drive him home because you know his wife and his kids were already gone and everything else so we drove him home and you know it was getting dark when he got off and then you know we talked we talked for a little bit while well, they talked for a little bit because i was still just kind of a kid you know nobody's really going to listen to me but as as we left you know my oldest brother was was driving my second oldest brother was on the passenger side we were in the car and me my other brother and my two cousins were in the back in the back seat and it was one of oh no my one of my other cousin was in the front seat with my two older brothers so me and my other brother and my other cousins were in the back my cousin my other cousin that were was in the back with us in the car was was asleep and as we were driving back you know it was already dark and you know down the reservation road which was a dirt road you know no no lights other than our own headlights so my brother started to mess around. He was turning the lights on and off, on and off. So <laughs> he was doing that. You know, he turned them off, waited about two seconds, turned them back on. You know, and he was saying, "What if we seen something? You know, run, run across, or or anything like that." You know, and uh, he did it like two or three times. And then, but of course, nothing happened, right? And as we kept on driving, he did it again. But this time, he waited for about five five seconds because he knew that that 
that piece of road was straight you know there was no turns and there was you know there's no way that you could miss the road right there so he he left the lights on off for five for about five seconds but as he turned it back on <laughs> there was a cat sitting right in the middle of the road looking right at us oh my gosh i remember the the shock you know like oh my gosh what's going on but we kept on going we didn't we didn't hit it or nothing we went around it it didn't even move you know it didn't even get out of the way or nothing it just stood there and looked at us and (laughs) oh my gosh that was one of the craziest things i've ever seen so we went around it um my brother took off you know we were driving probably before that i don't know just cruising you know like 20 25 miles per hour maybe but when we sat after, <laughs> after we seen that we brother <laughs> took off and he was probably doing like 50 55 and me and my other brother that were in the back we <laughs> we got so scared that we jumped in the front in the front seat it was we were driving like my dad's car was like a 70 77 impala or something you know one of those boats the ones that had the 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 two seats you know the front seat and the, the back seat with the bench so it was a huge car the inside was huge so me and my other brother jumped in the front with my two other brothers and my cousin and my other cousin was asleep in the back and he was the only one in the back well oh my gosh i just remember being super scared like what is going on and man we got home like right away but of course we didn't say to my dad because uh my dad wouldn't probably would have said nothing about the cat but he probably would have said why why were you messing around you know why were you turning off the lights on and why were you messing with the lights in the first place you know so that that freaked me out but was it skinwalker i don't know i don't know could have been um it's weird that it happened that way you know but but as for the cop the cop story um i believe it because my brother's brother-in-law uh he was so scared that for about maybe two months he had to have his mom and dad drop him off at work every morning because he didn't want to he didn't want to be driving by himself and he they, I think old his police scanner because he didn't want to listen to it anymore so it's pretty crazy you know it's pretty crazy but as with all folklore and mysteries and hearsays and everything else uh skinwalkers may be a part of that and it's just the making of our own imagination but i don't know some accounts are pretty crazy i'm pretty sure there's more out there but that's just my personal not not to me but to my brother's brother-in-law you know so somewhat close close to home but it's pretty crazy i don't know what i would have done that's it for today's episode and thank you for joining us be sure to follow us on our socials which can be found in the description We'll see you on our next episode, and remember, stay weird, stay curious. Ash. 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 Oh, Ash. Oh, yeah. I like that guy. I'm supernatural. Didn't care for the mullet, but yes. Due to a bad snowstorm. Nope. 
due to a bad snow. S nope. What? <laughs> I'm like smirking when I say. That. I know. <laughs> Eyeballs. Death. Eyeballs. Eyeballs. Death. Death. <clears throat> you got this. Rotting corpse. You're almost done, Mary. Dancing phalanges. 